Yeah, so we'll get rolling and probably some people will uh, join us along the way. I'm Jack Ziegler uh, from the Texas Beck Institute. And um, we're gonna do something different. This is a kind of a new program. We haven't tried this before. So um, I'm gonna just give you a, some of the highlights of uh, uh, patient um, identification and some real highlights of surgical technique and so, some cases. Uh, for both um, cervical and lumbar arthroplasty. And I thought we'd, we could do the cervicals first and then the lumbar second in case there are folks who are not interested in lumbar, uh, give them a chance to, to bail out and have dinner. Um, but the whole thing should be about a half hour or a little bit less. And then we'll leave um, a good amount of time for a discussion or talking about cases. So that's sort of the intent. But again, this is kind of a brand new um, program that uh, just finished polishing up uh, right before we got on the air. So let me know if um, this is not delivering the goods. So, um, so the first uh, part of this will be uh, cervical and um, I just thought I would give a, a little commercial to uh, Sentinels nice enough to, to be putting this together. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the uh, ProDisc C family, which is traditional uh, ProDisc C and then um, Protist C Vivo, which is uh, a little bit different in design and fixation, but the same articulating surface, a protist, um, a keeled protist like the original one, only with a shorter keel, and then a disc that, although it's uh, FDA approved, um, has not been introduced in the US yet uh, with a single keel above and two below. So this, this whole family will be available in the US pretty soon. Um, and just to remind everybody that in this particular venue, um, we can't, cannot talk about off-label use uh, because um, this is a Sentinel sponsored event and, and uh, my friends at Sentinel can get in trouble, lose their jobs, uh, get a speeding ticket or go to jail, you know, for promoting off-label use. I can do it and you can do it and we can talk about it offline, but um, we can't address questions about off-label use uh, during the course of this presentation, but if you have a particular patient who you think might benefit from that, um, you just have to find me um, outside this venue and I'm happy to talk and uh, the FDA is fine with that also. They don't have an issue with surgeons talking to surgeons about off-label stuff, but they do have an issue with companies promoting off-label and off-label just means not the way it was tested and the FDA approved it. So uh, for purposes of what we'll be talking about for uh, for the next uh, uh, 50 minutes or so. Yeah, it's ProDisc C, is single level use uh, so far uh, from C3 to C7 for on label indications, and ProDisc L, single or two level use in uh, adjacent levels from L3 to S1. So let's, let's start talking about cervical disc replacement. And, you know, what's kind of interesting is we, we all um, marvel at the technology and, and, you know, think how wonderful it is that we're expecting this artificial disc to recreate motion. But if you think of a normal, healthy specimen of a cervical spine, you know, a young person who was in a car accident, and that's why their specimen winds up, um, you know, just envisioning this, this mechanical disc now doing what their normal disc did would be interesting enough. But remember, we don't, we're not putting it in normal segments normally. We may do it in a cadaver lab um, because that's how the cadaver got there, but that's not why we're operating on patients. We're starting out with a very abnormal level. It either has a big um, tear in the posterior annulus with an extruded disc fragment or at least a, a, a stretched out posterior annulus with a contained disc herniation. Um, or it has a dried out disc that's degenerated, was worn down, and there are osteophytes. And, um, you know, so you're starting out with a level that's not normal. And now, in order to get an artificial disc in, we've cut out this huge anterior annular window. We've gone in, scraped out all the disc material. We've taken out two to three to four uh, millimeters of the um, uh, the uncovertebral joints and the posterior longitudinal ligament. So we've taken this abnormal level, made it incredibly unstable. And we're taking this little cuff link, um, sticking it in saying, not only do we want you to do everything the normal disc did, but also while you're at it, protect the facets. And, you know, you think about that, it's ridiculous that we even think that that's possible. And yet we're seeing uh, good outcomes uh, with 
ProDisc and, and as well as most of its competitors. So it, it's really kind of interesting how our expectations are, are one way, but when you really think about the disease disc segment we're putting it in, it's even more remarkable um, how well these artificial discs work. Um, and you know, from a technician standpoint, I mean, we also want to know that when we've taken the care to clean everything right, identify the right position and put the disc in, that's where we want to see it when patients come back. And uh, I think we've all done um, uh, competitive type of disc replacements where that's not always the case, where you know you put it dead center, um, that your, your post-op film shows it dead center, but your two-week film in the office show the disc is someplace else. And that, that's not good. That's not what we want. Um, and yet we want the disc to allow for early motion. So again, we're, we're being kind of uh, schizophrenic in our expectations, um, but that is what we expect our disc replacements to do. So these are the, the this is the labeling for um, ProDisc C. The, these are the patients who were included in the FDA study, and that's who the FDA says you can do these things on in an off-label use because we've already proven the, the hypothesis that it will be um, no worse or better than a fusion. So anything outside of the inclusion exclusion criteria, it's not a contraindication. It is just off label because it was not part of the FDA study. So uh, things like um, putting it next to a fuse level or putting it in, in multiple levels, um, they're not saying that that's the worst thing you can do, but it is just not scientifically proven by the FDA study and therefore not labeled. So what are the FDA indications? The FDA indications started out uh, predominantly for patients with cervical radiculopathy at a single level. That's who we enrolled in the study. Those patients had to have failed conservative care for six weeks um, and, and have an anatomic lesion. So a big juicy soft disc that brings a tear to most surgeons' eyes, if not saliva dripping down their, their chins. Um, because, you know, we know this is going to be a home run, you know, we're going to really help these patients. We knew that uh, an ACDF would make them great, um, but we've now got proof that ACDF does make them great, but a, an artificial disc will be better for them. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll share that uh, data with you in a little bit. Um, interestingly, single level myelopathy, if you have a disc herniation that's um, bad enough to cause myelopathy, if it's really at that single level, is an on-label um, use for an artificial disc. Many of us have been hesitant uh, because we grew up in a world where we were told you got to stabilize a, a sick cord and, um, and you want to be able to image past it. Uh, but the real world data really shows that patients who have single level uh, myelopathy uh, do fine with an artificial disc as well as they did with a fusion. Um, again, you don't want to take a patient who has congenital stenosis and four levels of stenotic um, cord compression who happens to be radiculopathic in one level. Uh, that's not the ideal patient to do an artificial disc because he's going he's to have issues at other levels, and, and that's kind of not fair to the disc. Um, and then we kind of expanded um, a little bit into patients who had more degenerative disease, more longstanding uh, bony type disease with certainly foraminal compression. Uh, like this patient has, um, as long as you can, you know, get into that foramen and do a, a reasonable foraminotomy, and you, you want to do symmetric foraminotomies for disc replacement because you're going to be moving that segment and not just locking it in place. But these patients um, were also good candidates for disc replacement. So radiculopathy, myelopathy, and, and bony radiculopathy were all reasonable indications. So, you know, if these are the patients that you choose to to select and in cervical spine, it's a little more straightforward than lumbar spine because we're operating for a neurologic reason. Um, should the patients do well? Well, we've got long-term data. I mean, we have a, a seven-year um, study that's been published since 2015. And this data was all taken uh, by an independent biostatistician, uh, Dr. Kopjar, you know, from University of Washington. He analyzed all this data, and this wasn't um, a company-sponsored data analysis. And we found out with a pretty high follow-up rate that the patients at seven years um, were really doing well. The ProDisc patients consistently better than ACDF patients. And you know, these patients were all prospectively randomized. The surgeons didn't randomize them. They were randomized by you know, Pricewaterhouse or, or some accounting firm. 
but they had significantly different and better uh, satisfaction scores for the patients. Their NDI was significantly better from baseline and much more, uh, much better in the produce patients than in the ACDF patients. The biggest thing we found consistently in at all the data points we looked at between the randomized um, uh, arthroplasty patients and orthodesis patients was the reoperation rate was always a multiple better in the artificial disc patients. It was somewhere between three and five times less likely to have a secondary surgery if the patients had randomly gotten an artificial disc and a fusion. Very counterintuitive, not at all what we would have expected at the, the beginning of the study. Um, and, and the really important thing is that patient satisfaction was always higher in the artificial disc patients, um, something that doesn't count in an FDA study, but it counts for us because you know, patients are our customers and they are our best uh, advertisers. So, you know, compressive radiculopathy remains the number one indication for cervical arthroplasty. Patients who have failed conservative care, they'd otherwise be um, candidates for an ACDF. And, you know, they're getting offered ACDFs all the time because that's, you know, uh, that's kind of a bread and butter operation for most spine surgeons, um, a very uh, uh, almost universally successful operation. And a lot of spine surgeons say, you know, why, why should I offer them something else? Um, and the less patient understands that they can preserve their motion, have a lower reoperation rate and protect their adjacent levels. And they say to that guy, I'm going somewhere else unless you talk to me about this replacement. I think that's going to be the game changer. It's really going to be patient education that's going to do it. Um, remember that myelopathy is not a contraindication as long as it's single level, but it's, it's not that common. It's not that common to see a single level of myelopathy um, with every other level being uh, okay. And then the least um, well studied and the highest threshold is axial neck pain. There are a couple of papers that support disc replacement for axial neck pain. We do do it, um, but we have a really high threshold. It's got to be a really solid patient and it's got to be patients who have gone through a lot of hoops. They failed lots and lots and lots of things. And we really look hard to find out where the pain generator is. Um, you know, whether it's uh, uh, interspinous ligament injections or facet blocks um, or even cervical discograms, we really want to be convinced that we know that that segment is what's giving that patient uh, their either discogenic headache or their uh, constant uh, muscle spasm and restricted range of motion and cervical or cervical thoracic pain. If you can identify those patients comfortably, they are extremely grateful because no one else is really offering them anything other than pain management. Um, but if you miss a few of these um, operating on patients uh, and they, they're not getting better because you haven't appropriately diagnosed them, um, they are, you know, there's stones around your neck and we're, we're trying to avoid that. Uh, some setup, uh, setup tips in the operating room. I think it's important that we control the, uh, the head on the other side of the anesthesia uh, curtain. If you're doing an ACDF and the anesthesiologist rotates the head 90 degrees to suck out the, the mouth and he forgets to put it right side up again and you fuse the patient in that position, um, you know, you bang the, the, the facets are not melding, but it's a fused level other than some rotational strain at the disc spaces above and below you're gonna get away with it. But if you do that with an artificial disc and you've cut your slots and put your disc in thinking that the subaxial spine is neutral and it's not, it's rotated a little bit because the head is rotated, you're stuck with that. And now that's a motion segment with asymmetric facets um, and that's gonna kind of negatively influence your outcome. So I think it's important the surgeon controls the head. I, I use a, a little chin strap or a head halter um, other people just kind of tape the forehead down or put something around the, um, uh, the sides of the head so that the anesthesiologist has a tougher time uh, trying to, to change it. Um, you want to support the patient's neutral lordosis. So you want to look at their neutral films. You want to see what their normal lordotic angle is and try to support that so that when you um, are putting your disc in, when you're hitting against the anterior spine, you're not getting rebounds. Um, you're getting some resistance and you're gonna, gonna put your disc in, uh, in the disc space in a neutral uh, alert amount of lordosis. Uh, for operating at C6-7 on patients who have uh, big shoulders or a really short neck, 
you got to have good visualization. I, you know, we've all kind of been in a, a boat sometimes where you can't get down to see the level you're operating on. So you put a marker in the last one you can see and count down. And, you know, you can get a fusion done that way, but you can't do an artificial disc that way. You have to be able to see the level and almost to the disc level below that so that you can put your pins in appropriately. So there are these little tricks about putting sailing bags or um, if you have a good uh, x-ray tech, usually they can, they can cone down for you, um, but you got to be able to see it. And if you have a patient and uh, no matter how much you're working at it, you can't see that level, you have to you at least have to talk to the patient beforehand about doing a fusion or waking the patient up and bringing them back another day uh, with a different strategy. Uh, we usually uh, tape the, uh, drape the C-arm uh, out separately in a lateral position, put it up at the patient's head so we can do our work and the C-arm can slide back and forth. Most of the use uh, of it during the course of the case is going to be in lateral. You just need a, a one or two APs. Um, and neuromonitoring is kind of a regional thing. It just really depends on what the custom is in your area. We do do neuromonitoring because everybody in our community does neuromonitoring. <clears throat> um, and that may change over time. And every once in a while, it does pick stuff up. Um, it'll even pick up stuff like if you're pulling on the arms too hard in order to see that C6-7 and you start to lose signals in the brachial plexus before you even make an incision, it's nice to know that uh, and wake the patient up before you start your case. So it has helped us a couple of times. Um, a few tips about the discectomy. Um, you wanna do a thorough discectomy back to the PLL. Uh, but not violating any of the bony end plates. Um, that's a, 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 a hydrotopic ossification generator or a subsidence generator. You don't want to break through the end plates. Um, I like to uh, put the pins in relatively early, clean everything back to the PLL, put the distractor back under fluoro, back to the PLL and open it up, put the PLL under tension. It makes it easier for me to then resect the uh, posterior ligament and get to do my um, uh, facetectomies, uh, I mean, my uncle Tebow resections and foraminotomies um, uh, with that uh, under some tension. So that's just the way I like to use it. Some people um, do take the PLL before they put their uh, distractor in. And then you wanna look for either way, you wanna look for parallel uh, distraction. As far as removing the PLL, I think most people do for the cervical spine. Um, you know, if you're operating on a, on a contained soft disc herniation on a 20 year old who's got a really nice elastic PLL and you can get good parallel distraction and you're not worried about a sequester fragment, um, I'm happy to leave it in that patient, but that's not usually who we're operating on. We're usually operating on people that have some degree of degeneration and some contraction of their posterior ligament and they're gonna fish mouth and not open uh, in parallel unless you resect the, uh, the PLL. Um, so uh, take the cartilaginous end plate, as I said, do not violate the bony end plate. Um, try not to use a burr. I mean, it's a hard thing for spine surgeons to do who are used to using a burr, but the more you can do with manual instruments, the less burring you do, the less likely you are to um, get heterotopic ossification. And worse, worse than that is violating um, a, a structural end plate that's gonna cause subsidence. So we do, uh, you know, pretty close to 100% of our cases with um, manual instruments with just uh, kerosens and curettes. You want to do a, a good balanced release, but the bottom line still is, you know, we're decompressors. That's why we're operating. We're operating because there's either core or root compression, and you don't want to you don't want to do a bad job just to get an artificial disc in. So we have all our patients sign a consent for an ACDF. They all understand that. You know, if something happens and they have to get a, a fusion that we're going to do the best thing for them. And if you decide you've got to, you've got to remove so much uh, bony um, uh, compression that it's not a good place anymore to put an artificial disc, you have to have that ability to just switch gears and uh, do a PLL, uh, do a, a fusion. If you're working on the PLL, you can see you can take about a third of the, of the po uh, uh, posterior oncovertebral joint. Um, in order to do a foraminotomy, uh, but do it symmetrically. So in a fusion, sometimes, uh, you know, I would just do a foraminotomy on the side that was symptomatic and not worry about the other one because it's going to be fused. But here, you don't want to turn an asymptomatic contralateral side into a symptomatic uh, foramen. So 
Um, whatever Uncle, um, Uncle Vertigo resection you do on the symptomatic side, try to mirror that on the other side to get a good symmetric decompression and a balanced release. You got to mobilize the segment. That's where the patient is going to get their, um, uh, their pain relief. And then go and pick your, your device of choice, uh, whether it's the, um, the original uh, ProDisc with the keel, the short keel implant, um, or the Protus Vivo, uh, which has a convex upper surface instead of a flat one, and um, uh, spikes or teeth instead of a keel. And then the Nova, which also was uh, approved by the uh, FDA supplement last summer, uh, but not yet available in the US, but uh, ultimately will be. And I'll just run through uh, some cases really, really quick, just to give you an idea. So this is a patient with just single level cervical radiculopathy, 47 year old guy, six week history, severe um, bad arm pain, uh, some uh, uh, weakness in uh, muscles in his left upper extremity. Here's his pain diagram showing um, uh, upper extremity radiculopathy, decreased disc height at C67, um, and an uh, MRI scan you know, showing a, a posterior lateral disc herniation uh, that's failed six weeks conservative care in a, in a solid citizen. So, a uh, good patient for uh, surgery, different options available, uh, depending on your, your belief structure. Um, but, um, you know, the, it, interestingly, this was one of my partner's patients. They already seen a surgeon who uh, kind of recommended an ACDF that was denied because the guy didn't do a good job documenting uh, the neuro neurologic involvement. And then the patient started reading about disc replacement, came to see my partner um, who did a disc replacement for the guy. And you know these should be uh, home runs, and and typically are. It'd be, it's unusual uh, when they're not. This was a patient from the original FDA study. This was a commercial pilot for uh, uh, one of the, the big airlines, um, and this guy had a kind of a longer-standing history of pain, uh, but now a three-month history of radiculopathy. Uh, when he started tried to help somebody put their 400-pound uh, suitcase up in a uh, on a bin. Um, and he was not doing well. He was worried about passing his next FAA physical. He had weakness. He had positive EMG for C6 radiculopathy. Um, really didn't want to have a fusion, was willing to take his chances in the FDA study and get randomized. And he randomized to ProDisc. And here's his six-week uh, post-op X-ray. He's already showing good motion. And here was a three-year. He's already back flying, um, happy camper. Adjacent levels look fine. Um, and, um, and this was a, a, a good choice, a good um, lucky choice for him that he randomized to the artificial disc. Um, this is a case we like to show just to show that it's just not for everybody. Here was a guy who had uh, a bilateral C7 radiculopathy, both clinically and electromyographically but a lot of bony disease. He had huge osteophytes and, and foraminal narrowing. And, you know, you have to ask yourself the, uh, the question as a, a carpenter working from inside the disc space, can you get these things out? Can you decompress these with um, harming the shelf that you want to put your disc on? And is it just better to do a good decompression and do an ACDF, which is what I recommended to the, this patient. Um, and he left, he stormed out. Um, but here's a patient who had that similar pathology and somebody did take a burr to the back of his disc space and did burr down all of his osteophytes. Their post-op film on the table looked fine, but immediately post-op, the guy subsided his lower end plate into the lower vertebra because it was just cancellous bone. His center of rotation is anterior to the spine because of his head. And he immediately fell into segmental kyphosis uh, with distraction of his uh, facet capsules, distraction of his interspinous ligaments, and a very unhappy patient who now needs a secondary fusion. So rather than go down that rabbit hole, you're much better off making the decision uh, either preoperatively or certainly intraoperatively, but have the ability to, uh, to go to um, an, a, a fusion and you know, just kind of burn this image somewhere uh, 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 allocate a couple of a few neurons to that to keep that in the back of your mind um, when you're doing a decompression, whether you really should be doing an artificial disc on that patient. So um, that, that takes me to the end of the cervical part of this. So, uh, you know, I'm happy to, to talk a little bit or take a few questions if you have about indications and technique and uh, some of the pearls and pitfalls we talked about. And I think you know, we could talk about this for um, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or even a little bit longer and then um, go into uh, lumbar if that works. So 
um, somebody wants to uh, raise their hand or unmute themselves or um, type some questions in the chat room and uh, Kathy or some somebody will pick them up, you know, let me know uh, what you want to talk about for, as far as cervical goes. Um, otherwise, we'll go into lumbar and we can round back. But for the cervical people, uh, this is a good opportunity if you want to talk about this stuff for a little bit informally. A quick question here, uh, Dr. Ziegler, it's, it's Ken Duoso again. Um, uh, question, uh, two-part question. Um, number one, um, when do you decide to use um, an, an implant with a keel versus one without a, a keel? And, uh, and number two is, would you consider a disc replacement in a patient with quote-unquote mild instability? Okay. Um, the, the question about the keel really also relates to the end plate design. So the keeled implants really have a, a straight across end plate. So in a patient who's got flat end plate surfaces, I think that's a, that's a good fit for you. I have always liked the keel. I'm kind of keel partial because I know that the implant is gonna go where I cut my slot. There's never gonna be any question. So those are the two things that push me a little bit more towards using a keel. But having said that, a lot of patients have a cupped inferior end plate. And with the straight um, uh, pro disc, you have to be really meticulous about getting it all the way to the back wall so that you have good perimeter support. And then the keel will hold you and even though there's a little bit of a gap, we know that that fills in very quickly in the post-op period, but you have to be really good about catching the posterior rim of cortex. If you um, choose to use the, uh, the Vivo, that has a naturally convex upper end plate, and it will fit in the cup of the inferior end plate of the patient. Um, and you know, we see the spike gives very good fixation. It's had extensive use um, outside the US and, and reasonable use in the last few years in the US. So we know that the fixation is uh, very robust and the interface between the bone and the implant is the same. It's um, a titanium plasma spray um, and an interference fit and the articulating surfaces are exactly the same. It's the ultra high molecular weight poly and the uh, cobalt chrome um, alloy. So, uh, you know, you sort of have your choice. That's whatever your comfort level is, but those are kind of the, the, the discriminators I use. Um, as far as instability uh, goes, if somebody has really frank instability, they should be getting a fusion probably um, rather than an artificial disc. But if somebody has settling retrolisthesis or on flexion extension, they got a one or two millimeters of motion, um, we've, you know, we've just shown over time that the artificial disc, uh, certainly the pro disc, is, is uh, pretty hardy in restoring stability. And we use pro disc now preferentially in hypermobile patients, patients that you're worried about some of the other implants that have a sliding uh, core will just cause more pain for the patient because it's stretching their soft tissue we'll rein them in when we revise those oftentimes to a protus because it's more constrained. So I think it's good to have a more constrained implant um, or semi-constrained implant in your, in your armamentarium. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about a millimeter or two, but if somebody's really got, you know, uh, facets that you're a little uncomfortable with, soft tissues that you're a little uncomfortable with, and lots of slop, certainly segmental slop in the, in the level that you're gonna operate on, I would be thinking more about um, a fusion. You know, we're not going to get out of the fusion business uh, uh, for for a long, 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 long time, if ever. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything in the in the in the chats? I guess not. The only thing that came across, Dr. Ziegler, is there is a question that said, um, "Is there a disc space that you would ever consider too collapsed?" Um, good question. It, so for the FDA study, um, it was less than 50% um, uh, disc height was technically the exclusion criteria. And most of us kind of uh, sort of cheated around that because, you know, you see, you see more than 50% collapse in a lot of degenerated discs. And practically speaking, uh, most of us will tackle discs that are um, just a couple of millimeters tall, provided we can mobilize them. But that's where you know, we have every patient sign a consent for uh, a fusion. 
for patients who are very collapsed, particularly patients who are collapsed and have a lot of bony spondylosis, um, but who are demanding that you at least try an artificial disc, I make sure I take the consent or at least I eyeball them, look them right in the eye and say, listen, this is gonna to have to be a call in the middle of the case. This is an audible at the line. Um, some people will mobilize really nicely, no matter how ugly looking their x-rays and their imaging is, other people will not. And I, you know, I tell them that we'll try our best, but if we're trying our best and that level will not mobilize or refracture through an end plate, um, uh, where there's any other number of reasons why they're not appropriate candidates for a disc replacement that will have to do a fusion. And if that patient looks at you and says, absolutely not, then you need to say goodbye. You, know, you need to cut your losses before you cut the patient. But if the patient is reasonable and says, look, I trust you, um, do your best. This is what I want, but I want you to do the right thing for me. And that's 99% of the time, then, then you're covered. Then if you wake that patient up in and, and the recovery room and say, hey, listen, we had a diffusion, you know, they'll be disappointed, but they're not going to hate you. All right, so let, let's move on. Let's, let's do lumbar and then we'll kind of circle back and we can, we can uh, talk about both, okay? So lumbar is a little bit dicier because it's not a neurologic um, surgical solution. You know, this is, we know the patients who have radiculopathy from uh, uh, a disc herniation need a, a different kind of an operation or patients who have spinal stenosis need a decompression. They don't, they're not the primary candidates for lumbar disc replacement. Those patients are those who have mechanical discogenic pain. So pain, functionally disabling pain that has failed um, months of conservative treatment really, making their life miserable, nothing's working. And you can identify a one or two level uh, disc as the source. And um, that's, those are patients who traditionally would have been offered a fusion uh, for their mechanical back pain. And now we have really good data that shows that just like the cervical, that if you have a choice, you're better off doing uh, disc replacement or at least considering it than a fusion. I'll show you some of that data uh, real quick. The patient selection here um, comes more from the history than it does from the physical exam. In the cervical spine, you could say it's both. You know, it's a patient who gives you a radiculopathy history, but then there's a confirmatory exam. You know, you're looking for um, motor weakness or sensory abnormality or reflex change or something that corroborates um, your, your impressions from the history. In lumbar disc disease, in back pain disease, you really want to get the history from the patient. That's where you'll make the diagnosis most of the time because a lot of these patients have a relatively normal or just a protective uh, abnormality in their um, clinical exam. Um, this, the FDA study had uh, hoops that the patient had to jump through. They had to meet these inclusion exclusion criteria. They had to have more than six months of conservative care for functionally disabling back pain. The disc had to be the pain generator. Um, they had to have certain um, minimums in their VAS for pain, in their oscillatory disability index, um, and their bone mineral density. They had to, to meet criteria as well. So those were part of the selection criteria in the FDA study. We've incorporated that into our practice also because just like in the cervical outcomes, you'll see the lumbar outcomes. You'll see when you put a box around those patients, the patients inside that box can re will really do well. As you get outside the box, then you don't have that safety net of knowing that that, that patient population is going to do well for you. So the indications, again, functionally disabling mechanical low back pain, and I'll tell you how I make that diagnosis of discogenic origin that's failed six months of treatment. It is, again, not for primary radiculopathy. The insurance companies will shoot you down if, you, if you, that's what your records say. That's why you're operating. It's not for a primary disc disease. It's not for symptomatic foraminal stenosis um, causing primary uh, leg pain. So it's more of a little bit, it's more of a gray zone than, than um, cervical arthroplasty is because this is back pain surgery. Most insurance companies are really gun shy about approving back pain surgery. And many of them very frankly want to get out of the back pain business. You know how hard they make it even for fusion. Um, they, they pull out 1950s definitions of instability and that's you know what they're requiring now. They're sort of not recognizing 
uh, uh, mechanical discogenic pain as a surgical entity, even for fusion. Now they, they are being forced to by through the courts uh, to offer it to patients, at least on paper, for mechanical back pain. And they're sort of uh, resentful about it, um, always afraid that surgeons are going to overdo it and, and over uh, operate on patients. The inclusion exclusion criteria for the FDA study for the lumbar protest uh, were similar to what we just saw for the cervical, except it was for back pain and not for um, radiculopathy but patients were in 18 to 60 year age group, um, the degenerative disc disease causing functionally disabling pain in one or two adjacent levels uh, because uh, Prodisc did have a two level study that ran concurrent with the one level study and is FDA approved for two levels as well. Patients that have minimums of six months of conservative treatment of a 40% impairment or worse in their OSWIS 3 disability index and in the study, actually, the average patient was nine months of failed conservative care with an ODI of more than 60% impairment. So these were, were pretty hurting patients, and there were about 290 of them. They were randomized two to one to receive either ProDIS or um, uh, fusions, and then followed out for uh, two years and then five years. Exclusions were you know, multiple level disease, prior fusion surgery, and, and you can see the, um, uh, the uh, criteria. The one that we're really rigid about is T-scores because in the lumbar spine, um, if you get somebody who has uh, significant osteopenia worse than minus 1.0 or frank osteoporosis and they um, acutely subside, uh, you can't make that shine anymore. You know, whether you operate on them or not, you're never gonna get a good outcome. So we're really much more scrupulous. We get T-scores on every patient having a lumbar disc replacement. We did it for the longest time in cervical where the T-score can go down to minus 2.5, but we stopped doing it. We, we gave a paper at NAS that showed that we had picked up just three patients out of nearly a thousand. And those patients had pretty clear histories of either uh, early uh, gynecologic surgeries or long-term steroid use. You know, we would have picked them up anyway. So we stopped doing it for cervicals, but we do do that on every patient. We pick up uh, two or three young, healthy, 35-year-old guys uh, each year who have osteoporosis due to some malabsorption or endocrine problem and would have been a disaster if we did disc replacements on them. So it's an easy test and the insurance companies will do it. So here are my tips on, on how I identify patients um, uh, from talking to them and getting the history. So you want to find out does anterior column loading typically make their pain worse? And if you kind of start to lead the patient down that path, they'll usually tell you. So I ask them questions like, can you sit in one position for a long time? Can you sit through a movie? You know, in the days we used to go to movies before COVID, that's about a two hour sitting time. And most of these people, while you're talking to them, they'll be fidgeting around, but they'll tell you, no, I got to squirm in my seat. I couldn't sit through a movie. I'd have to get up in the middle. Um, how about I ask them when you're standing in one position, if you get stuck standing in line or you're at a counter um, making lunch or working at a counter, they'll, they'll tell you they got to move from foot to foot. They have to um, constantly be in motion. Um, do you have to um, support yourself when you're brushing your teeth? That semi-flex position really loads the anterior column. And some of these people tell you it's, it's miserable. They have to lean on their other forearm. They have to dance around while they're brushing their teeth. So just kind of think about stuff like that. I ask them, you know, if you step off a curb the wrong way, you're stepping a hole in the street or you're in your car and you hit a sudden um, bump, they'll like start nodding. They'll tell you that story that that kills them when that happens. They get a lot of back spasm, they get a lot of pain. And conversely, in the summertime, I say, you know, how do you feel if you're standing in a, in a swimming pool, if you have access to it? they typically get better um, because, you know, the buoyancy of their chest pulls them up a little bit, distracts it in this space. So, you know, start putting together the little puzzle pieces. Just think about these questions as you ask your patients and you'll see that there's a pattern that they, they fall into, the patients who have anterior column disease. Um, they generally do not and should not have significant neuroradicular or clotic symptoms. So if they get leg pain, just ask them a little bit, where does the leg pain go? Usually it stops above their knee, you know, it's pseudoradicular type pain. Um, they're usually not getting pain radiating down into their toes like uh, patients with real radiculopathy. Most of them can walk, um, uh, take a walk after dinner with their spouse. They're not 
uh, uh, giving you a history of neurogenic claudication. They're not having a progressive decrease in their walking distance over the, the last several months. So just by you know, teasing the questions to the patient, usually you can define the ones who have anterior column uh, mechanical discogenic pain. As far as a clinical exam, neurologically, you're probably not gonna find much. You know, they're gonna be tender, they have some protective muscle spasm. Um, they may have tight hamstrings because they haven't uh, been able to use their backs in a normal way, but uh, it's not true positive straight leg raising. Um, you wanna distinguish uh, anterior column pain from primary facetogenic pain. And there's some controversy as to how good we are clinically in, in telling that, you know, since you're just pressing on tender points in their back, but I, I extend them and then I, I, I obliquely extend them to the, to the side of their pain. And that really loads the facet. So if a patient who says, as you bring them back towards the ready, goes, that's my pain that's killing me. I give that patient some facet blocks. And if facet blocks give him 100% pain relief, even if he's got a dark disc on his MRI, um, I get that patient a couple of sets of blocks on a rhizotomy before I would do anterior column surgery on him. And he may have both, but you want to make sure that he doesn't have primary facetogenic pain because you're not going to make that better with a disc replacement. Um, you know, you want to, while you're chatting with the patient, you know, ask him to dorsiflex his ankle and slowly kind of bring it up, you know, to distract him and make sure he doesn't have uh, uh, distracted seated straight leg raising. Um, and as far as spinal stenosis, some of those patients do come in with primary back pain complaints, um, but that is because they've been leaning forward a little bit to open up their canal and they're straining their posterior paravertebral muscles. But they're usually going to give you a clotic in history. They're going to tell you their walking distance is less now than it was a few months ago. Um, and their imaging is usually going to make the diagnosis for you. So those are the main things that you want to differentiate. And it's, it shouldn't be a hard differentiation. So do these patients do well when you pick them right and you do your surgery? Well, we published the five-year data um, the Journal of Neurosurgery. And um, the follow-up rate was really pretty high. The patients um, uh, had reached their five-year points. Uh, the outcomes were really excellent. The, the good results we saw at two years were maintained to five years. Both of them improved significantly from pre-op baseline. Remember, they had failed nine months of conservative treatment of, of everything the pain management guys threw at them. They were here, and then they dropped by 50% right after surgery, and they stayed there for five years. And uh, all of our longer-term looks at those patients, even out to 10-year projections and some 10-year polling have shown that their 10-year data points are in line with their five-year data points. So uh, there's good durability to doing this replacement. But the segmental range of motion stayed really good. It stayed 7.2 degrees. It was 7.4 at two years. 80% uh, of the patients were back to doing whatever they recreationally did before, whether it was golf or bowling or hiking. They were 80% of these people with disabling back pain who could not do it before surgery were doing it at five years. Um, and this is even before the narcotics, before the opioid uh, epidemic stuff uh, started hitting medicine, uh, majority of those patients had gotten off their narcotics and most of them were on narcotics uh, before surgery because that's the treatment that they were being offered. So we've got good five-year data um, that showed that, um, uh, that these patients uh, really benefited from, uh, from the surgery we did. Uh, I think I'm going backwards, so bear with me. Um, what about the adjacent level? I mean, that's, that was the kind of the holy grail of doing disc replacement was, would it protect the adjacent level better than a fusion did? So we used the data because the patients got, got uh, x-rays at every single clinic visit and every single site all over the country. And all that data was digitized and sent down to medical metrics. So we asked the medical metrics guys to look at the supra adjacent level, not at the level that had surgery, whether it was a fusion or a disc replacement, but at the next level up. And we said to them on the pre-op films, please score that level. And then on the five-year standing film, score that level again, and then tell us, and we'll figure out which, what implant cohort they were in. And we wanted to see, is there a difference or not? And we defined the, the, any worsening as a delta in the ALD, the adjacent level degeneration. So here's what we found out. In all the patients who had um, a full set of X-ray films, the a worsening occurred five years later in almost 30%, 28.6% of the patients who randomly got a fusion. 
but of the same patient cohorts who randomly got assigned to get a, a pro disc, an artificial disc, only 9.2% of them showed worsening. In other words, 90% showed no worsening um, versus you know, uh, only 70% uh, of uh, the ones who got a fusion. And that is more than a three to one difference. That is highly statistically significant. But we went one better. We kind of peeled one more layer of the onion. We said, hey, there's a bunch of those patients who had isolated single level disease. They were mostly patients that had post laminectomy disc space collapse. Every other level was pristine. Let's tease those patients out. So these were patients who had one level of disease that was gonna get an operation depending on what they randomly got assigned to, but they had a zero score. They had a normal score at their adjacent level. What happened to those patients? Well, the ones who randomly got assigned to get a fusion now 23.8% of them had some level of, of worsening. Um, what usually a, just by a one level, sometimes a, a score of one, sometimes a score of two. So they now had a loss of disc height or in-plate sclerosis or osteophytes or some translation that they did not have before. But if they randomly got a pro-disc, only 6.7% of those patients had worsened. In other words, 93% of them were still pristine, they were still a zero. And that's, that's pretty good stuff. I mean, that is also greater than a three to one difference, also highly statistically significant. Um, we looked at all the patients that were in the PROTIS study. We said, can we take all the patients in the PROTIS study, the patients that were in the Charité study, the patients that were in the Maverick study, and the patients that were in a, Swede a Swedish study that mimicked an FDA study. In other words, patients who were randomized preoperatively and then followed for five years, can we pool all that data together and apply some statistical analysis to all those pooled patients and see what the five-year outcomes were? And that's what we did. And we published this in uh, Global Spine Journal in 2017. So which group had ODI success? In the US, that was who's got more than a 15-point improvement in ODI at five years, or in Europe, it was a 25 point improvement. It was highly statistically significantly in the well, artificial disc patients, all those four studies, lots of patients all over the world. How about who's got less pain? It was in the arthroplasty patients, not the fusion patients. Again, not what we would have intuited when we first started getting into this business. Here was the big one, was reoperation rates. In which group in all these patients all over the world were they less likely to need a secondary surgery? It was in the patients who got randomly assigned to a lumbar disc replacement. And that, that risk ratio was 0.48, meaning they were only half as likely to need surgery either at the index or the adjacent level at five years. And the last one was patient satisfaction again, the one that's kind of important to us uh, statistically significantly favoring the disc replacement patients. So this is not just me, not just my, my place of business, not just my study, not just the US, but all over the world pooling this data, um, it keeps coming up aces, keeps coming up the same way. So, um, you know, you got to respect the data. And when you start to realize that lumbar disc replacement has been subjected to more intense scientific and clinical scrutiny than any device that's in the body. Um, artificial uh, hips and knees, total hips and knees did not have to go through these, this kind of uh, study and, and haven't subsequently either. But you think of all the other implants that go in the body, you know, plates and screws, rods and hooks, even non-orthopedic things, things like um, lenses and pacemakers that go in by the, uh, by the bucket full every single day in the country have never had this level of scrutiny. And yet, you know, it was just uh, a month ago that Aetna finally um, uh, recognized a lumbar disc replacement as, uh, as necessary. So um, it's been a, a, a very uh, tough road for um, all the people involved um, in Sentinel and in uh, ProDisc and all the other implants to, uh, to travel. So let's, just like we did in cervical, we'll go through um, some, some quick tips on the surgical approach. Um, the big, uh, the, the operation itself is divided into big three pieces. One is the approach, and most of us um, in the US use an approach surgeon, either vascular trained or a good general surgeon um, who's good at a retroperineal approach. The most important part is the middle part, which is the discectomy and the mobilization. 
Um, and then the last part is the insertion of the implant. Those are the, the three steps involved in doing this. You gotta be able to see discs like this, you know, whether it's L5S1, but even four, five and three, four, you have to be able to see the right side, the left side, the top, the bottom, you know, you gotta um, be able to um, work on the disc and make sure that the soft tissues are, are protected, um, kind of know where the, uh, the boogeyman are, you know, the, uh, the um, the ureter uh, can be hiding uh, with the peritoneum along L5-S1 and easily injured the left iliac vein. You know, L5-S1 is not always a slam dunk. Sometimes the left iliac vein is enormous and can drape across almost the entire L5-S1 disc and has to be safely retracted and held out of the way while you're working and, and while you're cutting across these corners with a sharp knife at L3-4, you know, you're right up against the uh, aorta and the vena cava, and it's not a place for a slip or a hiccup. So um, you got to be very respectful of, uh, of where you're working in your office. As far as the length of the procedure, um, you should be spending most of your time on the discectomy and remobilization part, because that's where the operation is made or where it fails. If you can't get good parallel distraction and mobilization, even on a very contracted and collapsed disc, um, it doesn't pay to put an artificial disc in. If you just get it apart enough to slam in an artificial disc, it's not going to work. Um, so, you know, you might as well spare the uh, agony and, and just do a fusion. So the same deal as in cervical, we have every lumbar patient sign a consent for, um, a, for an ALIF. And especially the ones that are collapsed down that are going to be really hard to mobilize, I make sure I look them in the eye and that they understand that. And if you can find that patient who says no, um, you tell him to go away. Uh, you just say, you know, you, you cannot operate unless you have his understanding that you may have to make that intraoperative decision. So, um, you know, the annulotomy, uh, everything has to focus off the midline. So you need to identify the midline, make your annulotomy as wide as you safely can. Uh, there are two footprint sizes in the protist. There's a medium and a large, and it's no foul to take the trial and lay it on the front of the spine the first few times and get an idea. You always wanna to try to get the biggest in, uh, implant that you can to get good end plate coverage, but some patients are small, particularly at L3-4. Some patients are not gonna give you the exposure um, no matter how hard the vascular guy tries, and that will limit how far to the right you can go. So you can lay that trial on the, the front of the spine and get an idea and mark the, the lateral margins. Uh, but you always want to be symmetric to that midline. Uh, identify the midline. Um, use your, your landmarks or the base of the pedicles, which is the, um, the middle column. Um, the corners, which again is going to be the middle and the uh, anterior to middle column. The least reliable, but the one that everybody focuses in on is the spinous process. It is the furthest out of plane because it's the junction point of the lamina which is way the hell back there, right? It's the back of the spinal canal where the laminas are coming together. Um, so a tiny little bit of rotation will throw that landmark way off. Uh, the base of the pedicles, if they're symmetric and the um, amount of space from the corners of your implant to the corners of the vertebral body are much better uh, identifiers for you. Uh, find your midline, use a marker or a screw or a needle. Uh, put a bovi mark or a chisel mark so that you know where the midline is and everything should feed off that. Um, I like to use a cob to elevate the disc from the end plate and sometimes you can get a huge amount of disc tissue out without making a lot of separate uh, pituitary grabs, particularly in big patients where you're going past a lot of soft tissue. Uh, be nice to be able to get 90% of the disc out um, in one piece and then just uh, have to clean up uh, with the rest of it, but use your curettes, clean everything just like in the cervical spine, clean all the soft disc out, but leave the end plates, do not violate the end plates, um, clean them out to, uh, so that your subchondral bone is uh, nice and strong. Uh, people ask the question about remodeling, because sometimes you'll see lumbar end plates, just like cervical ones that have a cup shape to them. And it's really the same answer um, that we talked about in the cervical spine. As long as you have perimeter support, the keel will lock you in, and this gap will, will be gone, uh, if not at the two-week x-ray in your office, certainly by the six-week x-ray in your office, because you'll get, there's bleeding around that. There's contained 
uh, fracture callus that will um, uh, morph into bone. So this has never been an issue. And as long as you have good perimeter support around it, uh, the keel will hold the end plate in position. It's not gonna shift around like an, in, an end plate uh, without a keel. People ask about removing a posterior osteophyte. This is not a posterior osteophyte. That's just the back of a normally uh, curved body. But if you do have a posterior osteophyte that you think is neurocompressive, then you can get it. And there's no reason you can't go get it with a, with a kerosene. Um, there's no reason you have to put a burr back there because it's the same thing as we talked about in the cervical spine. If you start to burr, you tend to be um, exuberant with it. It also makes a lot of bone dust and heterotopic ossification is generally not an issue in the lumbar spine as it can be in the cervical spine. Um, but uh, end plate subsidence um, is a worry and we do not see it because we use mechanical um, instruments and not high speed uh, instruments. So the implantation itself is really um, pretty straightforward. It's uh, three steps. You, you have infinite opportunity to put a trial and make it as perfect as you want it to be. Once the trial is there, then you make your commitment. The commitment is uh, making a chisel cut over the trial. So you don't have to take the trial out, put something else in. You are cutting over the trial that you've pontificated over for as long as you, you want. And then you put your implant and it will go where your chisel cut was. So no worries that you're gonna put it in straight and it's gonna drift off to the side. It, it will go wherever you made your cut. So um, you have infinite opportunity to fine tune it, but once you make the cut, then you're married, then you, you made your commitment. Um, the classic implant choices for the protest that we used in the FDA study uh, were for all the angles, the six degree and the 11 degree angle to be built into the superior end plate, the inferior end plates, uh, whether it was a medium or large footprint were all zero degrees. And then the heights were built into the polyethylene button. So this is what we use for the FDA study and for many years. Um, but for some patients who have um, a, a good angle to their L5S1 particularly, but sometimes even for L4, 5, we would always say, boy, it would be nice to horizontalize that lower end plate somewhat and put the angles um, into the inferior component. So that is now available. So in addition to the six and 11 degree angulation in the superior component, there's now a three degree. And in addition to the zero degree inferior end plate, which has been around forever, there is now a three degree and an eight degree. Now you still need to just total 11 or six because those are the, that's the, the uh, on-label indications for ProDisc, and those angles have stood us in good stead for 25 years. It's not that there's an issue with them. It's just now shifting the angle a little bit to try to horizontalize this, the uh, forces um, and make a more horizontal inferior component. But otherwise, the inserter is the same. Everything else uh, uh, works um, the same. Um, the, the recipe that uh, Dr. Mornay provided um, and is a, just a good general reference at L5S1, where you really want to horizontalize as much as you can, he recommends using eight degrees inferior and three degrees superior at a level like L4-5, where it may be relatively horizontal. You can divide that up and make three degree and three degree. And um, what he said is, you know, if you have an L3-4, that's kind of cephalad angled and you want to drop that down a little bit you could consider using a six degree superior, you know, from the old system and zero degree uh, inferior. So these are options that the surgeon has. Every patient is different. You know, you do what is right for the patient and what feels right for you. But this, this uh, general recipe um, seems to work well. Some people still like to use six degree or three and three at L5S1 more than they use 11 degree. And, um, you know, there's, it doesn't seem to be a right or a wrong. Uh, patients uh, do equally well with both. We have not been able to identify a specific indication for a sp uh, specific uh, patient uh, geometry, but uh, part of it is just the comfort level as each surgeon develops his or her own uh, experience. So let me show you some quick cases. Um, Dr. Rushfish was nice, nice enough to uh, send us these cases and he, he really does beautiful work and a nice illustration. So this first one was a patient, a 55 year old guy who had a really degenerated L5S1. You can see with little lateral, lateral osteophytes and, and a vacuum. And he did a great job, nicely mobilized. You know, you don't have to worry about the anterior osteophytes here. Um, beautifully positioned and he used three degree um, 
uh, superior with eight degree inferior. And you can see the patient had a pretty good um, sacral slope. And in, in the old days, if this was zero and this was 11 degrees, uh, there would be considerable potential shear that in by bringing it up. And the other level to look at is the next try to get enough lordosis at L5S1 that you try to horizontalize L4-5 and take potential stress and strain off that level. And uh, the 11 degree um, was very appropriate for that. This next case was a 30 year old nurse um, uh, who, had, who needed a two level. This was uh, after two level approval. So here you can see he's done a little bit of work at 5-1, but he went in to do his implant at L4-5 first, and he did a three degree and three degree and then went back to L5S1, said a release there was uh, pretty straightforward. And he elected to do a paired three degree also. So three, three, uh, three, and three to get a nicely balanced um, uh, lumbar lordosis. In this third case, 50 year old uh, teacher with, again, a significantly degenerated 5-1 vacuum retrolisthesis. You know, we see this all the time, patient with functionally disabling mechanical low back pain, who I'm sure would give you great answers to your axial loading questions um, as you ask them, as you get more comfortable asking them. So you'd know that that's a good indication for it. And he did, again, just a, a yeoman, wonderful job. Um, and he, he elected to do three and three, and that resulted in pretty good horizontalization at the L4-5 level, and he's, he's taken um, more of the, uh, the potential strain off the L5-S1 than a zero um, and six or a zero and 11 would have done with the uh, older implants. And here's a 45-year-old patient with two degenerated discs, vacuum sign at L5-S1, uh, but you know, pretty, pretty good sized uh, uh, degenerative changes at both levels. And his pre-op plan was for three and three at L4-5, and he was gonna do the three plus eight at L5-S1. Um, which is what he wound up doing. And you can see he's uh, restored the lordosis nicely, kind of cuts off at uh, the uh, L3-4 level, but you can see the top of L4 um, is nicely uh, horizontal. And I think there's one, just one more. Um, this one's interesting because uh, he had to do two levels over time. So you saw this patient in 2017, the patient had significant concordant pain at 5.1, uh, but he's uh, an abnormal discogram with, um, with an annular tear at L4.5. He tried to get approval for two level, but it wasn't FDA approved. So um, he, the patient said, listen, I'll just do the 5.1, which he did, but the guy never got better. The guy persisted in having pain. And when he came back, um, the two level had been approved. So he was able to do our, uh, he was able to do an L4-5 as a second procedure and, um, you know, beautifully uh, restored his low dose. And so, you know, it's a good tool for us. It's technically more challenging than a fusion is, um, but the outcomes are better for patients. And we've got just this mountain of data that keeps getting stronger and stronger uh, that proves that point. So, you know, that kind of rounds up the, the didactic part of lumbar, um, and it's really the same kind of thing. You know, are you a little more comfortable now making that little more gray zone diagnosis of mechanical anterior column pain? And again, most of it's going to come from the patient. You got to just ask the, the patient um, to start you down the street and let them take you down the rest of the way, but ask about those axial loading questions. Um, any questions you might have about the surgical technique or, or tips and tricks and anything about the use of the new angled implants, uh, we're wide open and um, you know, we'll go back and get some cervical stuff or, or uh, just concentrate on lumbar. So go for it. Kathy, anything doing? Um, I did have a question that came in uh, with regards to cervical. Um, it's in a patient with mainly neck pain, at what point do you consider arthroplasty versus fusion, part one? Part two is, do you do facet injections? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll go for that first. You've got to be really scrupulous in uh, trying to find the pain generator if you do not operate primarily for axial neck pain. You really got to be sure that it's um, that you're at the right segment and that it's coming from the disc itself and not from things like the facets. You just got to be really good about working this up, have a much higher threshold uh, for making a surgical indication for axial uh, neck pain. So you want to exclude um, other levels. Um, you will hopefully have a partnership or a pain guy that you trust 
uh, to do um, uh, facet injections, um, uh, maybe ligamentous injections. And this is one of the few places um, that I, I have a really good discographer and I will ask them to do occasionally a cervical discogram because if a patient has absolute reproduction of their pain with pressurization of the disc, and this guy tells me this was for real, um, you know, those are patients that I will operate on. And again, they can be really grateful patients, but you just, you can't afford to miss because otherwise you're stuck with a chronic pain patient with no diagnosis. Okay, perfect. We have several questions that came in. Uh, the next one, can you comment on the posterior release in the annulus in PLL in lumbar arthroplasty? Yeah, um, that's a great question. You almost always need to release the PLL um, and taking it is really optional. So for me, I release it 100% of the time. I do not do not take it 100%. I take it very, very rarely. And it's really only when I'm looking for a sequestered uh, herniated disc fragment. That's when I'll take it. On the flip side, there are other um, people with a lot of experience who take it all the time. And at one point we looked at our outcomes, looked at range of motion outcomes and total patient outcomes, and they're the same. So you don't have to do it one way or the other, but you do need to minimally release it. So for my technique, after I clean all the disc out to the PLL, I take an angle 4-0 curette and I will walk that to the back of the disc space and fall over the edge and check on my lateral fluoro that I'm where I think I am and I'm hugging the disc space. And I do it in the center where the canal is the biggest. And once I get it and drop it down, then I just kind of wiggle my way from one side to the other until I feel it start to round back anteriorly. So I know I've turned the corner. If I'm operating on a patient that's had prior discectomy where I'm afraid the root might be stuck to the back of the body, I'll go to the opposite side first, make a, make a sleeve, and then I'll stay inside that sleeve as I hug the bone and come back around. Um, but it's, you know, for the orthopedists who are listening, it's, it's like doing a release for a knee replacement in a patient who's got a malalignment. You want to uh, loosen up the, the longitudinal tissues on that side so that you can straighten the knee when you put your knee replacement in. It's the same thing here. At the beginning, we used to release both the top and the bottom. And then I realized that made any sense. I mean, it's a sleeve. You only have to release one or the other. So um, usually I'll do the bottom of S1. But sometimes if you have better visualization, you can go up and do the, the back of L5 or the back of L4, depending on what level you're at. It doesn't matter. But you want to release that longitudinal sleeve of where the, the posterior ligaments attach. And you'll be able to get parallel distraction. But the success point is the same as in the cervical spine. You got to get parallel distraction. You can't get a fish mouth. If you get a fish mouth and you put your artificial disc in, it's going to spit out. So you've got to get good parallel distraction so that you can get your trial in and then make your cuts and then get your implant in. Um, so again, release or um, take, it, take it out, resect it, is really up to the surgeon and their comfort level for the majority of cases. Whereas in the cervical spine, I take it all the time. Um, and I think most people take it all the time, other than that 18 year old, you know, who's got the, the uh, non sequestered uh, disc uh, herniation. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question we have, um, it's asking, what do you consider uh, the sacral slope cutoff to be uh, for using a three and eight, a three and three and a five and one? Yeah. F51, I mean, sorry, F51. Yeah, no, no, I get it. I, I don't have an answer for you. Nobody's really been able to define that. Not even Dr. Mornay, who is the most number intensive uh, um, guy that I know. Uh, so if anybody had defined that with absolute numbers, he, he would have. So a lot of it is just kind of, um, you know, your feel, your, um, you know, your, your, what it looks like when you put in the, uh, the trial, the six degree versus the 11 degree trial. I think as we get, um, more use with these uh, inferior angles. Um, we, are, we just got an, an EOS machine installed uh, a couple of months ago. So we are now starting to do um, EOS on all of our pre-op and post-op uh, uh, lumbar disc patients. So I I'm hoping that in six months or a year, we'll, we'll have enough patients, we'll have an answer where we'll be able to say, you know, which angles pre-op um, and what um, angle disc replacements 
uh, give a patient a better post-operative uh, restoration of, of a normal lordosis. But this is an evolving science, even though it's 20 years old, you know, we've taken steps um, so slowly that uh, we don't have that answer for you yet. But we know that six degrees and 11 degrees have really stood the test of time uh, over 25 years. Um, and as I was sharing with one of the docs before, I think the, the worldwide denominator uh, or for um, ProDisc implants is north of 120, 125,000. So there are an awful lot of these have been put in over the last 25 years, both in Europe and the US um, with overwhelmingly um, uh, good to excellent results. I mean, very few issues, disasters, you know, horrendous things have happened. Um, so the six and 11 have stood that test of time. I don't know whether the body outside of L5S1 really cares whether you've got a three and an eight or an 11 and a zero, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Dr. Marnay does think that we can elevate L4-5 out of the iliac bowl and that that is a healthier environment for L4-5 than if we choose lesser angles and it stays inside the iliac bowl and doesn't have as much freedom of movement. And honestly, that is not something I would ever have thought of if he hadn't pointed that out. So, um, you know, we're just, we, we continue to learn from all this stuff and, and um, you know, we'll learn together. Thank you. Uh, the last question says, would you not, would you consider or not consider doing a lumbar disc replacement for a patient with a good history for discogenic pain, but foraminal stenosis that's causing radicular pain? Mm. Yeah, great question. Um, you know, part of the flat tire syndrome, part of just degenerative disc disease as the disc loses height is that you still got tissue in the annular wall and it's going to bulge and it'll bulge circumferentially. And this is one of the hardest hard things we're trying to, to explain to the insurance companies because they wanted to exclude um, any foraminal stenosis from being on the okay list for disc replacement. I said, that, that's, it's gonna defeat the purpose because foraminal stenosis from the disc bulging is a normal consequence of the disc degeneration. So I gotta differentiate that from real primary um, bony foraminal stenosis. So yeah, I mean, restoring the height and, and you know, we've been doing indirect foraminal decompression with ALIFs for lots of years at, uh, at Texas Back. So we're big believers in that. It's the same thing with an artificial disc. You're taking a disc that is four or five millimeters tall and now making it 10 uh, to 12 millimeters tall just by putting your implant in, that will open up the foramen. So that's, to me, not at all a contraindication. Um, but the hard part is now that we've got to uh, educate the insurance industry that foraminal stenosis is an accompaniment of disc degeneration, not a disease that is a contraindication. So, uh, you know, we're all, gonna, we're all in this fight together. You're, we're all gonna be arguing with uh, peer to peers about this and hoping that you get a peer to peer who's a reasonable person and not just, you know, towing the company line. Okay. I think that's it. Hey, was this okay for you guys? I mean, does anybody have any, any comments about whether this was a waste of time or a good thing? Because as I said, this is, this is new, you know, we haven't been doing this um, before. So you're sort of the test, uh, test kitchen for this, this meal. Is this helpful for the surgeons that are on still? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> yes. I heard, I've got an awesome, okay. it was a very, it was very useful. Thank you. That's uh, one good one. Yeah. All right. Well, thank everybody. Thanks uh, to uh, Sentinel for hosting this. And thank putting you it together. so much. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Ziegler. It was great. Well, I appreciate it. Good luck, everybody. Hey, listen, but make use of Sentinel. They will help you with your um, access surgeon if you need an access surgeon trained up. Um, they'll also help you get in touch with me or one of the other faculty if you have a question about a patient um, and you know you just want to talk about it or run a case by us the night before you do it or just run through the technique um, uh, with one of us, happy to do it. So um, use those resources. It's to everybody who's on this uh, screen, everybody's advantage for you to be successful and your patients to be happy that you've operated on them. So nobody, uh, nobody will work against that. All right, everybody stay well, best of luck. Thanks.
Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thanks, Dr. Ziegler. You're welcome. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.